that, I want to get into uh, a much more riveting presentation than we had earlier on advanced manufacturing, and that's uh, intellectual property. Uh, and put this in perspective, you know, I stepped into my first um, acquisition program in 1997 uh, when I showed up in P.M. Abrams uh, as a captain. Um, and since that time, I think I've been to every single uh, acquisition training course that's been offered by DAU and what have you to include, you know, Act 401 that they teach at the Eisenhower School. Uh, and the first time I had any instruction on intellectual property is when I showed up as a director of acquisition policy and had to start uh, putting pen to paper with some of the subject matter experts. Um, I know Major or General Bassett may be able to offer some insight on that, but it's just not something, you know, that they teach program managers. It's not a prerequisite um, um, to being in the program management career field and, and leading programs. And, you know, I look at the PM, whether it's a product manager at the 05 level or the project manager or, or the program executive officer, you're kind of, you know, the lead strategist of the program, if you will, with the support from the, you know, the legal team and the contracting team. Uh, and and uh, Chuck Harris, who's on the panel, made some really good comments that affect yesterday the panel that we had at Aberdeen. Um, and so I think that you know to to shape the the, the mindset of of the, the the of the leadership and acquisition programs that this policy is is very timely. And in fact, um, Dr. Jetty spent about 20 minutes uh, addressing about 250 acquisition professionals at Aberdeen yesterday to give him his philosophy. Um, and, and he's you know, looked at from both sides. He's been uh, in the government working with industry uh, and, and feeling the effects of not a well thought out IP strategy. And um, conversely, he has been in industry uh, and in situations that he was not treated so fairly by the government with regard to IP that he developed as a private entrepreneur. Um, and so the policy was designed at the outset uh, not just to be in conformance with statute, but the mindset of the leadership that, you know, we want a fair and balanced approach to intellectual property where the interests of both parties are respected and we approach it uh, from a, you know, a, how a, a business would approach it as opposed to, you know, how we typically sometimes do business in the government and leave some of these details to the afterthought. Uh, when in fact they can turn out to be vitally important if you don't uh, consider them from the outset. So with that, um, I want to talk about, you know, um, where the Army stands on IP policy. And as um, Ms. Lord pointed out earlier, the uh, OSD has also recently issued um, an intellectual property policy with which uh, we are, I think we're generally very congruent with that policy. So there shouldn't be any disparity between uh, OSD and, and the Army. Um, we look at intellectual property, um, and for us, it usually translates into, um, you know, technical data, computer software, and other kinds of data um, as as vital to both industry and to the government. Uh, to the government, as has been alluded to earlier, we need IP generally in a context of long-term supportability because sometimes we keep our systems on the order of decades. And for industry, um, it's the competitive advantage that makes business business and in, in, induces um, private industry to make investments on our behalf. So we look, we realize the importance of that, and that's I think well articulated in the policy. Um, so, and some of the background on the on the policy is uh, it was initiated um, basically in a change uh, in strategic direction, both from the uh, senior leadership of the Department of Defense and the Army, as well as what was in statute. Um, typically, you know, intellectual property was treated as, as an afterthought, uh, and I think um, Ms. Lord alluded, that, alluded to that earlier. Um, it's, you know, tactical, and a lot of times, you know, your program won't realize what it should have gotten uh, early in the program uh, until it's time to go into sustainment at milestone C, and that's really um, you know, at least for the government, is puts us in a very bad position to uh, achieve the outcomes that we're looking for. Uh, we've also, um, you know, reacted to some legislative changes, um, and uh, you know that the, some of the statute, you know, changed the way that uh, rights were allocated. Um, and from not having done this for a long time, I'm told it, you know, it, it goes back and forth in cyclical fashion. And now we consider this, you know, the swing 
uh, a little bit uh, closer to, uh, to the middle. Um, and again, we're trying to strike the balance between um, our needs as the government to uh, acquire and field and sustain uh, capabilities affordably, as well as to uh, make it a viable uh, opportunity for, for business and industry. Um, to, to in the past, you know, our approach um, in, in the department was, you know, kind of an all or nothing thing where you ask for government purpose rights and, um, and, and that's, you know, so we expect this and the statute support that to some degree. Um, but that's not what we're doing today. Um, it's not really, a, you know, never going to be a black and white situation. Um, in fact, we have five Pathfinder programs, we call Pathfinder programs underway right now, and not one of those has an identical uh, technical data, a computer software and rights uh, situation. Um, and the law has also, uh, you know, recognized that nuance um, and, and directed that we um, have tailored IP strategies that are, you know, unique to the individual program. Um, and as I said before, you know, our, our policy really in its essence is to, um, is to promote a more business-like approach. Um, we recognize the need to adapt to the new policies and, you know, a lot of cases the, you know, the DFARS has not caught up, but the guidance that we got from, you know, our leadership is that, you know, we're going to, you know, follow the, the law and so our, I believe our policy is well supported in statute. Um, it has four underpinning principles that I just want to walk through briefly before we turn it over to the panel. Uh, the first principle is to develop customized IP strategies. Again, no program is, is unique. Um, each one has different data and, and software requirements, and that needs to be um, considered in the customized intellectual property strategy. Um, what, we're, what we're not saying, though, is we're not talking about creating another standalone document. This should be the a constituent of the, the acquisition strategy toward the front end of the program and the life cycle sustainment plan toward the end. Um, second principle is the negotiation of custom licenses. Um, again, you know, the default position in the past has been, you know, we want government purpose rights and that you issue that in your RFP and you evaluate. Uh, that's really not where the Army is today. Um, we want to, you know, in some cases we might need, um, you know, you might have a program that has, uh, you know, this commercial software, but you might need uh, more than a commercial license, or you have something that um, is going to be, um, you, that's going to change very quickly that typically we might have gotten government purpose rights for in the past that, the, you know, the, by the time you need the, that set of data, the, new, the next new thing is economically available, and so you're going to replace it instead of buy it. And so the default is, you know, to t determine what your rights are, needs and data are, and uh, negotiate those. Um, the third, and this is an important principle, uh, is to negotiate early in the process uh, for competitive prices. Um, what we don't want is to get to, you know, the, the point in time where you're down to one vendor, and that's when you start evaluating um, or articulating what your needs are. It just removes the competitive advantage. Um, and as Ms. Lord pointed out earlier, competition is everybody's friend. Uh, and also, you know, one of the things that we're encouraging is to, you know, price the data and the rights uh, early on so it's, you know, it's, uh, it's understood by both parties, you know, what the, the true costs that are going to be at the time that the cost is um, actually going to be born. And the fourth principle, which is also very important, is to you know, communicate open, openly with industry. Uh, one of the, um, the components of not the, the policy proper, but our implementation guidance that we issued um, was a set of non-disclosure uh, agreements, um, one that would be between um, industry and the contracting officer, and the other one that would be acknowledgments of, of government uh, personnel that would be, say, taking, uh, taking a part in a source selection where they would acknowledge, you know, what the intellectual property was and the need to protect it so that, you know, we don't, you don't, you as industry don't have to air out your secret sauce uh, in front of, you know, comp competition. We can have those uh, discussions and we can protect, you know, the, the thing that makes your particular widget, you know, better than the other one. Um, and that was, you know, that was another tenet, uh, you know, facilitating that open communication, which we think is uh, important. 
And finally, what I want to talk about was where we are now. Um, you know, the policy is one thing, um, but implementation is even more important. We're trying to uh, affect cultural change. Uh, we've been in the process of, um, of engaging directly with active acquisition programs, um, and they range from, you know, uh, you know, aviation to software to, uh, to weapons to help incul inculcate these new principles into the workforce. Um, and we've been working with them as they develop their intellectual property strategies um, so that uh, we can take into account the program, you know, the program needs and develop those um, tailored implementation or the tailored intellectual property strategies um, uh, that they need to acquire their data and rights with. Uh, finally, um, we want to open it up to the panel to talk about um, you know, intellectual property. We know that this is typically a um, contentious in, um, issue between industry and the government as evidenced by, you know, the amount of open issues that we still have from the, the last 813 panel. Um, and if the last panel was as um, insightful, uh, if this panel was as insightful as the last one, I think it will um, help us all uh, reach a common understanding with the Army's new intellectual property policy. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, my name is John Etherton. Uh, I have been involved in the legislative side of the intellectual property debate ever since 1984, uh, when Congress uh, put the first version of 10 U.S.C. 2320 and 2321 into the uh, statutes, and uh, which actually was the result of a big disagreement at the time between DOD and industry, and we've seen sort of a lot of um, <coughs> fighting and, and discussion and disagreement and consensus on that legislative process ever since. Um, I've got a few questions that I'm going to put to the panel. We're going to talk about some issues. We invite you all to send us things that you also would like to have us do a uh, discussion on, and we'll try to insert those into the conversation. Uh, I think this is going to be a very quick period of time because there's a lot to talk about here. Um, I'd like to start out by uh, uh, sort of pointing to the panel. The last panel that you had, my understanding is you were talking about additive manufacturing. Uh, the topic of non-FAR OTAs came up in the last presentation. Um, I think so we're dealing with a lot of sort of new or different ideas on uh, uh, the types of acquisitions that we want to do and acquisition strategies. My question to the panel is, to what extent do you think the current rules, as they're in the DFARS uh, and in, the, in statute, uh, really ad are adaptable to that new reality? Or do we need to look at a different allocation of interests among the parties or a different way of thinking about what the issues are with respect uh, to an IP policy as we go forward? So I'm just going to throw that out to the group. I'll start off with that. Um, you know, one of the things that's a um, constituent of our policy is the, you know, the custom uh, or specially negotiated license agreement. Um, you know, that I think right there allows the parties to um, come to a mutually agreeable understanding. One, um, two, um, nego you know, the, the customization piece through uh, and the communication piece would, uh, you know, enable. Um, so maybe something less in some area or something more in another area that tr traditionally would have been covered with the broad brush of, um, you know, government purpose right. So that's really what we're, we're trying to discourage that as a, a going in position unless it's, you know, absolutely necessary for the sustainment of the program. And, and finally, um, with the other transaction authority agreements, one of the things that we've been uh, discussing with the, the Pathfinder programs, because a lot of these are, are, are OTA-based, um, is that, you know, the spirit of the DFARS, um, you know, if there's clauses or language that's, you know, not necessarily in an OTA, it can be put in an OTA uh, as long as that's something that's agreed to between uh, the, the, the partners in that bargain, which again goes back to negotiation and the custom uh, IP licenses. Yeah, I, I frequently hear this question, and I always ask myself, 
what else can we do for policy? When you look at the DFARS right now for technical data and computer software, we've got five different sizes that fit all. You've got a pretty well understood policy for non-commercial technical data. You've got non-commercial computer software. If we go commercial computer software, we start with your license. And then we've got um, commercial technical data where, again, we want to see what terms are you offering. And if none of those four approaches work for you, you pull the ripcord and you say special license. So when I hear that policy is a problem, you've got all of these barriers to reaching a deal with the government, I'm, I'm always curious as to why you say that. Because when I read the DFARS, what we did in 1995, we built in there five different sizes. One of them is, let's just sit down and talk about it. So I, I thought it would be a good idea to let my favorite IP attorney go before me. Always a good, you know, don't talk in front of the lawyers. Um, I, I, I think his, his point's exactly right. And I think it gets at, at something that's hard for us to do at times. In a, in a culture that says we, we want to kind of follow a checklist of including certain clauses, in the area of IP, it's really about you got to start with, you got to lead with thinking instead of compliance. Because uh, as I think Mr. Harris just said, we've got a lot of discretion if we uh, agree to use it, but then we have to be smart enough to think our way through all those options. And, and, and where I started at was, you know, the commercial model is different. And so as, as the Army has gone to try to do more rapid acquisition, we are less in a model where we've paid for the development of a given product and its intellectual property. And so if I don't, you know, my, I, I'm, not a, I'm not an attorney, uh, but I do know that, that if I paid for the development of a product, I think I have some rights to that intellectual property. And if I didn't pay for the development of that product, then, then the vendor retains the rights to that intellectual property in any given transaction, and it has to be negotiated. Uh, but, but, you know, as, as Mr. Raftery said, you've got to negotiate that up front because if you wait until after a competitive period, uh, the, the, you're in a different relationship with your vendors and your leverage is entirely gone, right? And so uh, I, I think, you know, we know that intellectual property is important to the government because we need it for things like sustainment. We need it so that we can do effective competition in the future. Uh, and we also know that it's important to industry because it becomes their leverage to be able to maintain their position in the marketplace. Uh, so it's that, it's that dance that we do. And when we negotiate for IP really matters. Uh, it, it matters an awful lot. It's the difference between being able to buy intellectual property at a price that makes sense. And in some cases, we have to be able to walk away from that product and move on to something else because we can't come to terms. Uh, and and it, it actually can come down uh, exactly to that. So um, IP is leverage. It has value, particularly in terms of future revenue. And if we don't negotiate it until later, some of these companies have a requirement for their shareholders that they negotiate a, a, a fair and equitable price for that intellectual property, which is often calculated based on a future calculation of, of what the value of that intellectual property is to the company, which is different than they have to price it if they're in competition. So it's a, it's a, this is a very nuanced, challenging effort, and you gotta bring really experienced uh, acquisition folks to the, to, the, to the table that understand the value, understand what intellectual property means, and can arrive at, a, at an agreed upon fair uh, value for that intellectual property. I'm gonna echo a lot of what I've heard. Um, I think planning is terribly important and I, I think um, one of the things that was also mentioned was training and that we need to broaden the span of who understands and deals with these issues. We can't think of IP and our licenses and how we acquire it as a matter left to the contracting community or uh, a narrow band of lawyers that specialize in this stuff. Uh, so one of the things we're trying to advocate is uh, to broaden the span of training that people get during their careers, uh, learn more about this, ensure the program managers understand uh, what the options are. Uh, as to the question about whether we need a different framework or something, I'm not sure uh, we really do. Uh, as, as was said, We've got plenty of tools, it's just how they're applied, how they're used, uh, and how they're implemented throughout the life cycle of a program. Uh, and I think executing, once we've established the terms in a contract, is important. Uh, what are our data rights? What technical data do we need? And then actually get it. Take delivery of the, of the data and ensure you get the license rights in that data that are appropriate for what you're trying to do. 
it, it's all for naught if you talked about it up front and then you didn't do that later and get delivery of the data. Uh, and, and again, negotiating is, is what we're trying to encourage more so than the standard rote categories of I paid for it, therefore it's mine. All this stuff is open for negotiation and, and that's what we're trying to encourage going forward. Um, hi, so I guess um, <laughs> I, I feel like, all right, I'm the only member of industry <laughs> here, but what I'd love to say is that I actually agree with what my colleagues have said. Um, I, I, I get the question a lot. I'm, I'm an IP lawyer, and I spent the first uh, 15 years of my um, professional life as a commercial lawyer and then uh, came to Lockheed Martin about 10 years ago. And um, I, I'm asked routinely, you know, are these terms and conditions okay? And my first question back is, well, what are we doing? What would we like to do? Um, I've, I've always believed that terms and conditions are not the driving force, but in fact, what the parties want to accomplish should be the driving force. And I, I am actually incredibly encouraged by, one, the shift of, um, the IP and the data rights negotiations um, uh, more uh, to involve the programs so that uh, the, the people who are really thinking about what do we need to accomplish technically, what are, our, what are our considerations, what are we trying to do over the long term, those things are being thought of early so that then you can figure out what rights you need and then um, you can ask for them. And uh, one of the things that, that when you when you see a lot of contracts, you realize that um, at least in the commercial world, if um, if the parties get along, nobody actually ever reads the contract. Um, it's only when people are mad at each other that they actually go back and read the contract. And uh, what I mean, it, it's kind of true, you know, because if it's all working, you know, who, who cares what's in the contract? Um, it, and so what what I look for. Um, is really trying to get a meeting of the minds. And on the IP front, that's hard. It is, it's a lot of tea, ball, tea reading and crystal ball gazing because you don't know at the beginning before you've developed something what is really gonna ultimately drive the most value in the program. You don't know what you're gonna need over the course of sustainment, but what you, you do need to do is you need to think about that early and then based upon that, start figuring out, okay, what terms and conditions apply. And I also really like the idea uh, and the encouragement that we can have some, some true, more flexibility in the negotiation of licensing. Um, the specially negotiated licenses, not always looking for a fairly boxy approach, um, I think will be really mutually beneficial. And, and frankly, the more we think about this and we more, the more we talk about it up front, the clearer it's gonna be, the better our relationship is going to be and the more successful our contracts are going to be. So I, I think we have enough uh, you know, flexibility in the approaches and the training and the move towards really having valuable early and often discussions is, is I think will be very helpful in accomplishing what both sides want. Adrian, I'd like to follow up that question with another one, which is um, how does industry, you know, what approach does industry take uh, when it comes to valuation decisions for IP? As it enters in, there's a, sort of a suggestion that there's a different approach, perhaps in the solicitation um, uh, proposal process, maybe for what maybe comes later if the negotiation falls too late in the process. What, what are the factors that uh, your company or others you believe uh, take, and I'd like to get a reaction, I guess, from the DOD Army side as to you know how you see or react to this approach to valuation when it comes to the negotiation process. Uh, so the, the subject of valuation of IP is actually also really hard. I don't know that there's anything particularly easy about IP, but valuation is one of those fuzzy things that even people who know what they're talking about are not 100% clear on. Um, the, the issue with IP valuation is that the, the standard methods that we use are really 
um, dependent upon having commercial data to be able to come up with the price. Um, generally speaking, you know, in kind of the commercial world, there are three different approaches. Basically, the cost approach, which is, um, you know, how much does it cost for you to create it? And that can either be the cost of reproducing it, meaning exactly the same item, um, or it can be a replacement, which is the exact same or a similar functionality, but not the exact same item. But basically, that the first approach is how much does it cost? Uh, the second approach is a market-based approach, which is, you know, how much would it cost you to get a similar item in similar conditions? And that's based on actually having a market where there are similar things that one could procure. Um, and the third thing is an income-based model, which is, um, you know, identifying how much income you're likely to get over the lifetime of this product and then basically valuing that at the present day. Um, those, those three approaches, with the exception of maybe the cost one, are, are hard to do, particularly for non-commercial items and for a lot of the procurements and the technology that we're developing. And uh, I, I think that one of the things that um, I think it's important to, to try to think about that, but is there a way other than kind of what we've been doing, which is largely, you know, we as the suppliers identify what our cost is going to be and, you know, then kind of what we want, you know, our rate of return to be, and that's sort of how we price it. And commercial companies really do the same thing. Um, one of the things, though, that, so I don't think there's a direct translation between commercial valuation and, um, and non-commercial valuation. Um, I will also say that there are people who disagree with me on that, and so to some extent I'm, uh, this is kind of my own personal view of it. But what I do like is that we, um, we uh, part of the 813 panel was advocating kind of a pilot program to work on studying valuation to figure out what approaches might actually be valuable and be useful, because I, I think that's a bit of an unknown. And if we, again, as you know, with everything else, if we can agree to sort of, um, you know, wander into the unknown together and kind of figure this out, then I think that's ultimately where we're going to have to go with valuation. I, I just think that the commercial approaches are limited and they are they are absolutely informative, but maybe not they're maybe not going to be the most helpful in a lot of the procurements. Yeah. So, so as I've watched industry behave in response to our solicitations and requests from the government to price out intellectual property, um, I, I do believe that their behavior changes dramatically depending on where we're at in the life cycle process. Uh, in, in competition, I usually find industry doing the first thing that you just said, which was they base it based on their cost to produce it, and then they price it based on their incentives, which is they price it at a value they think they have to price it in order to win the solicitation. Right, because they're they're making that calculation of probability of win. Uh, as long as they cover their costs, then it's uh, sort of a negotiated value. Um, and and I also think the things that affect their pricing has to do with things like the threat of competition. Right, how how likely is it that they lose this contract as a result of their pricing or other folks? The barriers of entry into that marketplace. How easy is it for the government to replace their product with something else? And then some sense of reasonable profit and value. Um, and I'm, I, I think it all comes down to industry is going to behave as they're incentivized to behave. And uh, it's not reasonable for the government to try to get them to price it once they have a monopoly on a particular end item and then expect them to price it reasonably based on the goodness of their heart. They've got an obligation to their shareholders to, 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 to price it in a way that reflects its true value to the company. And, but, but the true value of the company changes depending on when we negotiate. And so we've got to be smarter buyers. I think it's really important, and we try to demystify this IP valuation. There is no silver bullet out there. When you sit down and you look at income, market, cost approaches, you get all these really nice um, economic journal articles that are 30, 40 pages long, a bunch of algorithms. Let's sit down as business people. You've got some IP that we want to buy, we want to use. Let's focus on cost as a bottom line, if you can't recover your costs, you're probably not going to want to sell it to them. So we should be starting off at the bottom line at what's the cost here. And then let's talk about markets, where I've seen these negotiations really go well. We start to look at a field of use, we start to narrow down the market to what the government wants, 
Are we talking the entire government? Are we talking foreign military sales? Or are we just taking foreign military sales off the table? That's going to be yours. We're not going to look for any rights in that right now. We can negotiate that into a special license. So you kind of have to have an idea when you come and sit down at the table, what are you willing to sell? And you've looked at your IP, it's yours, you know what it is, you've got your multiples, you've invested in it. So let's start to look at that. We're, we're not looking at giving you an income stream unless we start to talk you know, with, with Mr. Staub about every time I push that printer and a part comes out, you know, am I going to give you three cents a part, four cents a part, something like that. So income stream is not an approach that's very attractive to the federal government. Our contract officers are very used to a cost approach. We understand in industry, if you price everything at cost, you're not going to be in business for very long. You've got overhead. You also have shareholders to keep happy. You've got to be thinking about multiples of that return on investment. So the more you understand your IP, the more you understand your market, and we can start to define what you're trying to sell us and what we're trying to buy, the special license approach works really, really well. And I found a lot of times I don't even use the term IP valuation because that gets everybody a little nervous. I want to lower the temperature. I don't want people to be nervous at all. You've got something you want to sell. We want to buy it. Let's figure out what the market should be. Let's figure out the costs. Let's figure out those multiples. And then let's see if we can structure a special license in a deal. I, I'd just like to point out that's why he's my favorite lawyer. <laughs> I think we've talked about this from the industry side, um, and, and I would agree uh, to much of what's been said. Uh, on the government side, I think we have a long way to go to figure out what is this IP and these data rights worth to us. There's what industry believes it's worth to them. We need to understand why they believe that. I, I agree with that. Uh, but I think similarly on the program side, there needs to be um, a, a better, more structured way to think about well, what's it worth to get this stuff? Because it's a two-sided transaction. And I, I think we need to work on both sides, understanding industry and understanding ourselves, frankly. One of the reasons the question was posed originally is um, based on um, some of the uh, senses that we've gotten as we've engaged with our Pathfinder programs and as well as industry. Uh, some of the, the comments that we've gotten back uh, from industry is if we're going to negotiate, we want to in, uh, engage in a competent negotiation. Uh, and I think that, that what they're not talking about is a, you know, an email exchange between the contracting officer being whispered you know, by the ear of the lawyer uh, you know, going back and forth. Um, and then the other part of the impetus was, as I look at what we tell people to do uh, in the policy, um, I think back as, you know, there's things that we're telling them to do, but what typically have we trained people to do uh, and engage in a, in a um, professional negotiation, in my mind, isn't one of them. Um, I've only really formally encountered, uh, you know, the art of negotiation um, twice. Once was in a, a, a master's degree program at the Command General Staff College, and I think once was uh, a little bit at PMT 401. Um, so uh, it, it's not something that we are wise in the ways of, and I think that if we want to go into a negotiation, it's something that bears uh, at least some instantaneous training. Um, and my, my previous experience with studying negotiation is, you know, a, 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 the more knowledge that you as a negotiator have about the interests of the other party um, puts you in a better position for that negotiation. So it's, it's an area that we wanted to tee up to do some further exploration. I wanted to try to get DAU here uh, to get them to try to take that on as something, uh, you know, that we look at so that we can provide at least some body of knowledge for um, programs as they um, as they enter into these kinds of situations because it's not something that the skill is not sitting on the shelf right now in my opinion it wasn't you know when I was a product manager the last three years one of my perceptions in watching the debates over the years on the appropriate balance on intellectual property um, policy has been the challenge that the government side has had in trying to figure out what its requirements are, especially when you look at a longer term time frame. Even when we were in a 
process that mainly relied on major defense acquisition programs in a more traditional pathway to deliver capabilities to the warfighter. I think I was sort of circling back a little bit to my initial questions. Uh, we're now following sort of a, a number of different approaches that uh, we've got to acquisition of capabilities. We're, we mentioned additive manufacturing. We've talked about OTAs. I think another area is uh, the modular open systems architecture uh, approach, which all major programs under the law are now required to deal with. And I think a lot of those approaches, uh, because they really posit, rather than, at least in my view, rather than a system going forward, you've got essentially a carrier or platform of capability carrier that essentially things are going to be plugging in and being removed throughout the life of a program in a more thoroughgoing way. How do we get our arms around the requirements piece of this as we start these various approaches to understand exactly what it is we need as an underlying basis for negotiating for intellectual property? So Mr. Raffery talked earlier about this pendulum swing that we've had in, in military and Army acquisition over the last 20 years. Uh, if you go back 20 years ago, the assumption was we're going to buy 100 percent of the intellectual property so that we can uh, sort of build to print anything we go buy. And an example of that would be the family of medium tactical vehicles. Commercial design, we bought the, the, the design for it in competition, and we later recompeted uh, to some great savings the production of, of that vehicle. Say at the other end of the spectrum was probably the striker program, where it was acknowledged as an interim capability. The Army wasn't going to keep it very long, and, and by then the pendulum had swung uh, to the, I think somebody, people had called that TISPR, total system, something the Air Force came up with that didn't go so well. And uh, <laughs> th it had swung all the way to the other extreme, and, and the idea was that you shouldn't buy any intellectual property, and you should rely on the contractor for the life cycle support. Uh, and, as, we, as it turns out, we don't have anything that looks like an interim vehicle in the Army. We tend to keep things much longer. And so, so well into the program's uh, development, we found ourselves uh, negotiating for, procuring, uh, collecting the right level of intellectual property so that we could then effectively sustain that system. So, so I think, you know, we talked about the pendulum. It's either all the way to the left or all the way to the right. And I think where we've landed is probably the right place, which is we know we have to buy enough intellectual property to do effective sustainment activities, but probably not enough to go manufacture it on our own because the cost of maintaining that property, that intellectual property over time is probably more than the potential savings uh, that we might achieve through future competition. And so the, the key here is there's probably no one size fits all, and, and we've got to be thoughtful and, and analytical about what we buy and when we buy it. Uh, especially when we start going to commercial items, when in some cases a company's entire business model hinges on a specific technology that they may not even be willing to sell us. They may not even be willing to license it to us if they're afraid that that uh, trade secret would leak out if they show it to me. And so you end up in this kind of, it, we, we, we have to have people that can be thoughtful, analytical, and capable of dealing with IP on a an, on an, uh, per instance basis rather than sort of this broad brush. You know, it's much easier intellectually to be either on one end or the other. You buy it all, you buy none. But when you have to negotiate the middle ground, you, you better be uh, thinking your way through it. And, and I think that's where we've, we've landed by necessity. Um, I, I'd love to follow up a little bit on what I kind of see the adventure of the suppliers. Um, what I'd say is that that there are actually there there are commercial suppliers who have worked with the government before have people who have and have a fair degree of understanding of how that works there are also a lot of commercial companies out there that are terrified of working with the government um, because the minute they are convinced that the minute they deliver something that somehow it will be slurped up and made available you know they they're just they're they're going to lose the control um they don't understand um they, uh, you know the the acquisition regulations um they don't really know what you know the government is like as a customer and so one of the things and and my background is actually in software and i spent a fair amount of time when we would 
um, you know, basically want to um, integrate a software deliverable and have a bunch of different um, uh, commercial vendors, um, really having to kind of go through with them even the basic things we had to take out of their commercial agreements, you know, the, the basic stuff, choice of law, indemnification, stuff that people who know the commercial, know the, the government world uh, understand immediately why this is not ever going to be an issue and they don't have to worry about it. But having to go and basically rewrite their commercial agreement, uh, some uh, particularly small ones, newer ones, don't even have an in-house lawyer. Um, so, and they're not really sure that they want to go pay their outside counsel, you know, another $5,000 to look at some particular clause that they now have to take out. Um, and, and so when uh, what, what happens is that in negotiating these agreements, um, I sort of, uh, there, there are moments that I feel like, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, trying to run with, you know, like the, uh, a, a series of weights attached to your legs in the sense that like you want to do something and you think that it's the right approach and you as a prime contractor, you know, think you can live with that, but then you try to talk to your suppliers and your suppliers are like, no, time out, not going to do that. And and so that that's why to me, the the earlier we can understand what the requirements are and what we have to offer and figure out how to match those up, um, and, and the more we can be open about discussing those things, I think the better off we're going to ultimately be. Um, but I, I did want to make the point that um, there are times that while people who work with the, with, you know, have uh, the government as a customer routinely uh, can live with a lot of things, that commercial world, there really is a is a gap and a divide, and that that takes a lot of, you know, basically care and feeding to make sure that that we get you know the quality of products um, in that we want you know to to be able to deliver, but at the same time working with some very reluctant, hesitant uh, commercial vendors, and so that's that's one thing, another part that goes into all of this. And so sometimes I will say I come back with, I can't believe I have to make, have to actually have to take this position because I'm constrained by what I can actually deliver from a, uh, from a supplier as opposed to what I would in the ideal world be able to say. And so sometimes, you know, you're constrained by that. And that's, that's another thing to be open about and to talk about so that we can come to the right balance and make sure that um, you know, we're delivering to the customer what what you want and what you need. So, I just want to add on to the, the last two comments. Um, yesterday, after the the road show that we hosted at Aberdeen, I was approached by uh, someone who I believe is in General Bassett's current portfolio, talking about a device that they were going to buy, and typically they would buy you know the technical data and government purpose rights to go with it. And so, well, by the time that we need this the next thing will be in place. So why would we need it? I said, exactly. That's exactly how we want you to think. So if you don't need the data uh, and the rights, because by the time you, it, you know, you're going to actually use it, uh, the, the, the replacement for the thing that you're looking to service uh, is, is you know, the, the need has been overcome. And so I think that you know, the light is coming on um, that we're only going to, you know, set requirements for the things that we want and, you know, that we need. And to go back to General Bass's point about thinking about what you need and doing that analysis, and then that's what you go out and you uh, work with industry to get. Yeah, the word requirement is very squishy. It's not well defined. And start off right there when someone says to you, you know, here are my requirements. Well, what requirements are we talking about? If this is a new capability, we're talking about design, develop, and test it. Does it even work? I always tell my clients, why in the world do you want to buy IP for something that doesn't work? If it's a plane and it doesn't fly, what do you need the data for? So a lot of the requirement, in my view, should always be focused on the initial performance requirement to make sure the darn thing works for what we think we want it to do. Everything else can be done as options, and option cleanse preferably. And we've got to sustain it. Are you going to sustain it or are we going to sustain it? Typically, nobody's going to sustain the whole thing. So that's where a modular open uh, systems approach should be very appealing to industry. These are the widgets that are really important to us. These are the widgets we want to sustain. 
if we can sustain these widgets, government, these are the parts of the system that we're willing to let you sustain. We understand that we don't want to be out there in the middle of the battlefield helping the troops get off the field if it breaks. So there's going to be a certain amount of field maintenance that you shouldn't be concerned. And you shouldn't want all these representatives traveling with us because they don't want to be on the battlefield. We've learned that the hard way. So if you're not willing to work with us on the field maintenance, then we've got a really big problem. Depot maintenance, I get it. There's certain things about engines, transmissions, we don't ever want to deal with. Suspensions, we can usually handle suspensions pretty well. So I always say to my, my client first, are we sure that it works? Once we know that it works, then let's start talking about the IP to re-procure the parts that we think we can do get competitively, because why'd we pick that company? They're pretty good at something, and maybe those portions we want to stay there. And those are the types of things that you should be negotiating in those requirements. When I look at this architecture, there are certain things that we should probably be re-procuring from us. Other things can be competitively re-procured. And then how do we sustain it? And then when I always get to modernization, people make modernization sound so complicated. When you modernize something, there's really only three ways to do it. How many people, raise your hand, have taken their cell phones in when there's a new capability to have it remanufactured? You go out and you buy a new one. When we got handguns, you know, we, we're going out and we're buying new handguns. So I'm either going to repurchase the whole system, or I'm going to look at a component within that system. And this is where we start to fight over software. If it's a software component, you want to repair it and modernize it. I want the ability to repair and modernize it. Let's figure out which portions of that system are so critical to you that you're never going to share that source code with. And let's have that honest discussion up front. And if the answer is no, you can't ever have any source code ever under any situation, let us know that up front. Now, you may not be in business for very long, but that's an approach you can take. Let's not keep kicking the can on those issues. And so if we start to talk about those requirements to develop it, field it, re-procure it, sustain it, and modernize it, now we've got requirements in bite-sized pieces where we should be able to reach agreement or understand we're not going to reach agreement pretty quickly. I think a lot of this boils down to communication. Um, I, I think we're trying to encourage these kinds of conversations uh, within a program team, a multidisciplinary com combination of people, engineers, logisticians, sustainers, you know, everybody that's involved in the product over the life cycle, and then have that conversation with industry. If you actually just talk, rather than, I think the term requirement uh, can be too narrowly defined as, as getting overly specif specific about things. If you can sort of back up, have a conversation with industry, and there's ways to do that uh, without being overly specific, um, I, I think we'll be in a much better place. If we're more clear with industry about our intentions and what we think we want to try to do, and then have them iterate with us, and we'll get to a better place in the end. Uh, sort of a new dimension, uh, yeah, and this is a question that came in from the floor. A uh, new dimension uh, in this conversation is security. Uh, we have a lot of discussion about supply chain security, um, the CMMC process and program that everybody's working on. Um, the question somebody asks is, what are the Army's expectations uh, for security of IP held by vendors? So that's an interestingly phrased question. I, I almost expected you to turn it around the other way, which is I think usually industry expects me to protect their IP. I, 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 uh, I'm usually less worried about industry accidentally divulging their own. I mean, I don't want to be flippant about it, but uh, I, I can tell you, though, that on the, on the flip side of that, um, I think there's an expectation that when, when intellectual property is exposed to the government that we protect it, uh, commensurate with its value, and and that, that we're very respectful of that intellectual property, particularly as it as it relates to sharing it with other vendors. Uh, and I think you know maybe we there's you heard earlier that the the thought process is once you've shown it to the government, it's as good as gone. And I, I think we have to be trusted partners where that's absolutely not the case, uh, so that we can uh, we can do better about those things. 
one of the tenets of the or embedded in the policy is that we you know respect and protect uh, each other's IP, um, and I think that you know this is a this is a big issue, um, and I think General Bassett can probably associate with some of this. Um, you know, we found this out, you know, with advanced manufacturing that the, you know, the, the manufacturing sector is one of the most attacked from a cyber perspective um, uh, market or sectors of the industry out there, and they're one of the ones that's least able to defend against it. Um, so, you know, the, um, the MXD uh, program, you know, has active cyber security uh, initiatives underway. So there's, you know, there's kind of two aspects of it. There's a, you know, a raw physical security aspect of it, and then there's the protection from uh, unauthorized disclosure. Um, and we have to be concerned about both, in my opinion. Uh, and I think that, you know, as we start working with this this concept of digital engineering, um, that you know, the, it has to be undertaken, you know, by professionals that understand not just the, you know, the uh, operational and technical characteristics of your system, but also that security is an integral component of that. And I think a properly posed uh, IT system will accommodate both of those things. My question was really uh, security from a foreign adversary standpoint. Um, what does the government expect from vendors who hold IP that could be uh, stolen by others? I think we have to be equally concerned with not with foreign, but also the insider threat. Um, you know, my my last program um, was uh, was one of the first in the army to get an uh, an ATO under the risk management framework, uh, and, and that was a bugger. Um, and so not only did I have, you know, dot and &E looking over my shoulder from a, you know, a security perspective, but also the process to get it accredited. Um, and, and the threats are pervasive. It, you know, some of it is, um, some of it is actually, you know, malicious. You know, you got disgruntled people. Um, but then you also have stupid stuff like, you know, key walk passwords and stuff that are still on systems. So, um, you know, I think that we had to be vigilant. Um, in cybersecurity, from both perspectives, one from the you know unauthorized disclosure, which would you know your IT system would have permissions, um, but then it also has to be hardened against outside attack. So we have some new FAR clauses that which require vendors to to provide for specific cyber protections for program related information. Uh, my expectation personally would be that they would protect their own intellectual property with at least that level of cyber hardening. Which which we do, and, um, and then there are FAR ND FARS clauses that require certain things. But also, one of the things that is is actually um, really helpful in that realm is that with the defense industrial base, there is there are a group of both government and industry people who basically pool all of their resources, and that that constant need to make sure that we are as far ahead as we can be, uh, catching things as quickly as possible, the bugs and, you know, all of these these uh, little, you know, things that seem to somehow always show up. And, and what, what, is, what is really, I think, working very well is that collaboration so that we're all um, try doing the best we possibly can to defend against those adversaries. And that, that has to be something that is continually done jointly because that's there are just too many out there to do individually. And so that is incredibly important, I think, to, to everyone, you know, in, in this whole uh, industry. Uh, the question sounded like it, it was about the supply chain. Um, I'd encourage you to look into the, the CMMC model that, that ANS is starting to uh, develop and publish. Um, and, and that's about dealing with the entire supply chain down to very low tiers. Um, and establishing some degree of, uh, I'll call it a cyber standard, but, but it will be flexible and kind of um, tailored depending on the nature of what your company does. If you make rubber bands, maybe you don't need to be as cyber secure as someone that's doing some more exotic work. Um, but there's going to be an expectation from the department uh, that, that, and there'll be a quiz uh, up and down the supply chain, uh, are you protecting the data? 
it, it, it's kind of surprising how much uh, technical data passes back and forth up and down levels of the, the DOD supply chain and, and the weakest link in that chain becomes a risk. Uh, and so that's what we're worried about. And, and it's not just the primes that we need to pick on. The entire supply chain is going to have to up their game. The Secretary of Defense has said China is engaging in the greatest intellectual property theft in history. Uh, at least we pay for it. Right, and, and in fact, um, one of the things that we actually do as we are vetting our supply chain is that where there are opportunities for us to, you know, basically help them to get up to speed, we, we frequently do that. So it's a constant, um, it, it really, it's a constant vigilance. It has to be a constant partnership. And so it is uh, a, an enormously important focus for us, and that is not only for ourselves, but also for everybody in the system, the suppliers, the subsidiaries, you know, the partners, everybody that we're communicating with. It's, it's, so it's, it's a great question because it's incredibly important. But the cost part of it is that's, that's all part of the debate that's going on right now is, well, I can't afford it. Uh, what, are the, what are the possibilities about how to make that work? How to we just can't stand to let things alone, though. Well, we've reached the end of our hour. Um, I want to thank all the members of the panel for their thoughtful comments and for the audience uh, for the questions and the interest. Um, I Just sort of in closing, I think we are seeing what I hope will be a little bit of a change in the conversation, which has seemed to have been going round and round on similar basis for the last 30, 40 years. Uh, one other thing also I just want to point out, which I also think is a very positive and constructive change and was a recommendation of the, of the 813 panel. And that is that uh, the DAR Council in putting together the regulations and their process build a portion of that process at the front end with a lot of constructive dialogue uh, between the, among the parties uh, before we actually see a proposed rule that starts the formal rulemaking process. And we've had a couple of those meetings on relatively simple rules just starting out. But I think if that process can be embedded and sustained, not only in this area, but in others, I could literally see, given the history, we could be shaving years off the implementation process for statutory changes as we go forward. So I think that's another very positive development in this area. So with that, I thank you for your time and uh, wish everybody all the best. Thank you.